I'm your host, Dr. Kyle Richards, and we have a great session planned for this morning. Just to refresh, now the purpose of these webinars is to highlight the exciting and innovative work that's being done at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Urology. But more than that, we also want to generate a discussion within the broader urology community so that we can all continue to work together to make innovative advancements in urologic care. Now, the format of today's session will be a 20 minutes presentation with 10 minutes of Q&A. We're gonna actually have a little break in the middle for some Q&A. So feel free to enter any questions or comments that you might have in the chat at any time during the presentation. I'll be watching that chat closely as your moderator and host. Now, our next webinar, we wanna promote um, all of our speakers and our next webinar will be from um, Dr. Margaret Canadler on November 15th from 7.15 to 7.45 in the morning. She'll be speaking on new frontiers in laser technology. So you won't wanna miss that one. And keep in mind, all of our presentations will be posted online uh, afterwards. Now, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Vinaya Bhatia, our featured speaker. Dr. Bhatia is one of our new faculty members that joined our department recently in 2021 after completing her fellowship at the Texas Children's Hospital in pediatric urology. Now, in addition to her pediatric urology practice, she is also the director of medical student programs in our department, and she's very passionate about her topic for today, which is pushing the envelope in surgical education, producing high fidelity models for surgical simulation. Thanks, Dr. Bhatia, and, and uh, the podium is yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Richards. Um, like you said, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's good to start with an understanding of what simulation is. And it's been defined previously as a technique to replace or amplify experiences with guided experiences. It should be immersive and it should evoke or replicate the really substantive aspects or components of the procedure or experience you're intending to simulate. <clears throat> and why does it matter? It's useful for teaching technical skills in a safe space, right? If a complication occurs in a simulated setting, that's a safer place than in the operating room. It's a helpful start, especially for you know junior level trainees. There's some controversy about how much it can help senior trainees, although I think we'll present some data that may suggest that it does. And we know that practice can improve outcomes. And here, what I'm hoping to talk about a little bit is how you know we can think about developing and validating models in a really systematic way. And in the second half, we'll kind of touch on some options for even virtual simulation in the COVID-19 era. So, so think about how to develop and validate uh, models. I think it's important to conduct kind of a needs assessment. So getting broader perspectives from people in or around your field and really creating a pilot model with dissemination in mind. You know, I think a lot of us um, create models in silos and then you know, our great ideas kind of, um, you know, they never spread. We never have an op opportunity to really share it with other people. And so I, Personally, there are so many frameworks for effective dissemination and implementation, but one that I have found helpful when thinking about how to make really meaningful surgical relations that I can share this is the re-aim framework. So going through this, it includes, you know, the idea of reach. So how do I reach the targeted population? How do I test the effectiveness of my, in this case, simulation? How do I ensure um, you know, that the institution will support adoption of this simulation? How do I ensure that my simulation is administered correctly? And how do I make sure that the skills that are you know, really obtained from this simulation are um, sustainable? And so we'll kind of go through um, an example of how we use this um, for one of our simulations here. I think two other things to keep in mind, and these are often and, um, you know, significant barriers to promoting simulation programs are, is the simulation expensive to create? Because this can affect, you know, reach, adoption, and implementation. And is it easy to reproduce in low resource settings? Kind of goes along with the idea of expense. Um, but I think in this case, you know, maintenance is a major issue because if 
you know, keep building isolation in order to test maintenance of skills, um, that can be, you know, um, prohibitive in an area that may not have a lot of resources. <clears throat> so in hypospadias, you know, as a pediatric urologist, this is always a hot topic. Um, there is robust literature on the substantial learning curve for hypospadia surgery. Um, the chief of our department, actually, Dr. Walid Farhad, had previously published on the time required to learn and then develop competence and then develop proficiency. And he actually produced a curve that showed the number of cases for each of these milestones. And that's more than a hundred cases to go from learn to competence. So I think that that's kind of a critical um, concept because the risk of complications after hypospadias repair over the long term is substantive. Um, in minor disease, it's about 5 to 10 percent over the 10 to 20 year period. And then in more severe disease, we see complication rates upwards of 40 to 60 percent. So this learning curve is important to overcome as early as possible in training. So our hypothesis here was that if we were able to create a microsurgical model to improve specifically this learning phase of hypospadia surgery, we could really expect this curve and hopefully facilitate sooner acquisition of competence and proficiency. And thinking about our definition of simulation, you know, focusing on the core concepts of the skills that we would want transferred to trainees for hypospadias, it's really microsurgery. Whips, because that is a totally new skill set that you wouldn't necessarily be practicing in other aspects of urology as much. Um, and so there was a practice curriculum for basic skills um, in microsurgery, not specifically hypospadias, that was developed at the um, Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto. And this was a task, low fidelity tool that re, really like deconstructed all of the techniques we use in microsurgery into very basic concepts that, um, you know, students and trainees could practice using loops. And so we thought, you know, we could expand on this curriculum for microsurgery an intermediate fidelity model for hypospadias, um, specifically urethral plate dissection and suturing of the urethral plate. There are many steps where, you know, complications can arise from, but that is kind of the first step that really should be tackled to prevent complications. So, I acknowledge here uh, Dr. Kevin Elisiri at the Mordridge Research Institute here at the UW, um, who was absolutely instrumental in helping us build our hypospadias model. Um, we created a mid shaft and actually a subcoronal hypospadias model um, <clears throat> in SolidWorks, which is a program software. It does three modeling. Um, we were then able to print a mold. And then actually create a silicone cast, um, after which we attached a urethral plate separately with glue. Um, and our goal was to really simulate um, the turgor of the tissues that trainees would experience when doing a hypospadia pair. And so you see that final product here over to the bottom right. And <clears throat> in our pilot, we had 22 urology residents. Um, about half were here at the UW and the other half were actually in Dublin, Ireland. And in preparation, we gave them kind of a theoretical lecture covering basics of loops or specifically to handling, instrument tying and knot tying. And then we picked three of those skills from the Toronto um, practice curriculum, which were parallel face suturing, uh, which is critical for the urethroplasty portion of hypospadias, um, scissor cut, which is important for urethral plate dissection, and rice grain forcep uh, transfer to a small hole, which is important for handling of the tissues um, during the urethroplasty. And so for our hypospadias model, you can see we didn't have a foreskin, but again, we were really focused on urethral plate dissection and urethroplasty for this. So we um, created a random two groups. In group one, we had the trainees do three low fidelity exercises and then do our hypospadias um, urethroplasty. And in group two, we had the group do hypospadias procedural tasks followed by three low fidelity exercises. And we did a comparative effectiveness study 
disparity between these groups because the goal was to understand, you know, which of these could lead to improved outcomes. Our hypothesis was that group one may have um, better skills at the time of the hypospadias repair. So we had our final products were um, reviewed blindly by three independent attending level pediatric contusions across the country. So we actually took photos um, and our partners in Dublin, Ireland, and our group here reviewed those photos together to decide, um, or sorry, blinded from each other to um, kind of grade the quality of the urethroplasty um, on a Likert scale. And so this was really our test of of making sure that our intervention was implemented correctly. <clears throat> and interestingly, group one did outperform group two in all three tasks. Um, it's important to note as well that suturing and cutting task scores were associated with the overall score. And interestingly, training level was it's not significantly different between groups one and two. So this improvement in skills was present regardless of trainee level, which kind of speaks to the fact that sometimes simulation can help even advanced trainees improve their skills. And we had high acceptability rates. Um, so this was kind of our, you know, our satisfaction scores, um, thinking about our re-aim framework. So 73% of trainees said that they would uh, be happy to attempt a hypospadias repair under supervision. 91% felt that the model was useful to them, and 82% believed that the steps of the operation were appropriately duplicated. Um, so, in terms of our next kind of uh, approach to the rest of our re-aim framework, uh, looking at adoption, reach, and maintenance, I have to give a shout out here to Vishnu Sridhar, our research analyst, who's worked really hard to um, help us reproduce these models on a larger scale. Um, and I think it speaks to the um, uh, ability of our model that he was able to successfully do so. It took about six to eight hours to produce one batch of models, uh, which was about 10 models, um, costing about $550 to print. Um, so our goal is now to disseminate our models to other centers across North America and Europe for validation. This will be tests of adopt reach and implementation and our eventual hope is to actually retest our participants after a prolonged interval to see if the skills are maintained over the long term <clears throat> questions about any of this yeah uh, let's take a pause there that was a great a uh, great start to dr batia uh, i I want to just start by saying, well, how did how did you personally get interested in simulation? Can you tell us sort of your simulation story? <laughs> yes, um, I have always uh, been kind of obsessed with uh, creating better models for simulation. I trained at a center where we did a lot of advanced laparoscopy, um, so laparoscopic partial nephrectomies, ureteral reconstruction, and I didn't like going to the OR feeling like. I was underprepared. Um, so we created several models to use on laparoscopic simulators in residency, and I found them incredibly helpful. Um, using chicken breasts to simulate partial nephrectomies. Um, we actually 3D printed kidneys for practice for pyeloplasties, which was a blast. I had so much fun with that. Um, and so I found it personally so beneficial, even as a senior resident, you know, for um, learning important skills. And I saw those um, improved abilities, you know, kind of in real time in the OR, I felt different, you know, operating. So I couldn't imagine, you know, training without something like that to help um, on the side. And so it became something that was important to me even in fellowship. So I had um, kind of simulation set up in my office for the residents to come and do before they would come to do hypospadias repairs with us um, or orchiopexies or any kind of basic open case. And I think that they felt that it was beneficial too. So it's always been kind of a, a little passion of mine. That's great to hear. It's great to hear the, the story as sort of, you know, why you got involved in this kind of work, which is, which is, you know, awesome to hear. Uh, we do have a question from the chat. Uh, Dr. Nakata has asked, um, uh, I think in reference to some of the research that, that you've done, is how, how important is competition in simulation uh, and, and is that healthy? Coming from <laughs> someone that is incredibly competitive on the golf course. Yes. <laughs> what do you oh, think boy. about that, Vinaya? 
I think it is important. I think if we're not pushing ourselves to be better, you know, I think perfection is a moving target and we understand that perfection is changing, you know, even as an attending, I'm competing with myself. I'm reviewing my old surgical videos and thinking about how can I, you know, really change this for the next case. Um, I think competition is healthy and important and a part of being a great surgeon. Um, so I welcome it to a healthy extent. I, I will admit we did get into, you know, like partial nephrectomy battles and stuff when I was in. <laughs> Uh, residency, um, or, you know, our ureteral anastomosis on those pyloplasty models, and it did get a little obsessive. It turned into, you know, weekends on the simulator. So I think there's a, a healthy line to be drawn, but I think that, um, you know, it's good to push ourselves. It's good to have, you know, kind of a mental benchmark of where we want to be. And I think teaching residents that early on is a good thing. It can only help them succeed. Yeah, and he makes the point, uh, also Dr. Nakata makes the point that you want that simulation to have some sort of stress component, and maybe the com the competition is where that sort of comes into with lower risk, right? Because there's, yeah. you know, it, it needs to be, you know, friendly competition with your colleagues. And, um, and, and, and then, like you said earlier, you know, you don't want to, uh, it's a low risk environment. You're not going to harm any patients, and it's a great uh, opportunity for the trainees uh, and learners to to get their their hands on. So why don't we uh, why don't we move forward uh, with the rest of your your talk, and then we'll have some more time for questions at the end. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> so virtual simulations in the COVID nineteen era. Now, this was a uh, you know something that we had kind of been thinking about. Um, as becoming, you know, a lot more important um, now that the landscape of COVID-19 is still, you know, somewhat uncertain and things are kind of flowing and ebbing. <laughs> um, and so giving um, trainees access to good simulations that they can practice at home, they can't be in the R was something that we thought would be potentially really beneficial. Um, so we started looking at this in um, the realm of neonatal circumcision. Um, so neonatal circumcision is one of the most commonly practiced procedures in the United States. There are about 1.4 million performed per year, and about you know two to six percent uh, complications across the country, according to the most recent epidemiologic data. So um, <clears throat> in conjunction with several brilliant collaborators, um, we kind of assessed our uh, most recent complication trends in the local kind of Madison here in Wisconsin. And we found that the most commonly um, encountered complications were things that could kind of be prevented with better um, technique. Um, so these were things like adhesions, acquired buried penis, um, redundant foreskin, um, or incomplete circumcision, core D. And so we um, you know, pediatric urologists um, kind of in two uh, parts of their career. So ones that had recently matriculated to see what kinds of complications they were experiencing within that um, first year of practice. And then more senior pediatric urologists um, who had been in practice longer um, and could kind of speak to what they saw most commonly over prolonged periods of time. Um, <clears throat> and so we use that as our needs assessment for what kinds of things uh, circumcision course should focus on. And I should acknowledge here Dr. Max uh, Mazels at Lurie Children's, who's been our tireless collaborator in this effort. Um, we're very grateful to him for his expertise. Um, with him, we developed a 3D printed simulation model um, in tandem with his company, NeoCirc. Um, the approximate cost is about $500 for 10 to 15 models produced in a batch. Um, and we created a targeted curriculum focused on the prevention of complications based on the frequency that we just described. And so we've uh, developed a virtual simulation course on um, neocirc.org. These models can actually be mailed to participants and trainees are asked to perform a learning uh, portion where they review kind of core content um, that explains what the uh, steps of circumcision our complications are and why they happen, and then they complete a training portion with their, um, you know, silicone simulation at home. And this is an example. Um, you know, it really it, it breaks circumcision down in three separate techniques: so Gomco, Plastival, and Mogan on a really granular level. So this is just an example of 
how, you know, you're supposed to the gom cobell um, for, <clears throat> for circumcision. And um, <clears throat> our questions here were, you know, could a virtual format improve, you know, reach and adoption too? Um, and our plan is to have trainees submit a video of the procedure or perform the procedure using this model um, under our supervision um, and our preliminary data, because we did test this in a group of, um, you know, novice and more senior pediatric urologists suggests high acceptability across both groups. Um, we've also had pediatricians, senior pediatricians test this and it had similar stability. Um, and I just want to take a moment here to really acknowledge all the people that helped us with this work. Um, Dr. Farhad is, uh, you know, chief of our division and my mentor and has just been so wonderful about supporting these efforts. Um, Dr. Elisiri, who I mentioned before, and Dr. Mazels um, at Lori Children's. Um, questions about any of this? Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, Benaya. Um, I think uh, what I've learned from from uh, listening to to you speak here is that it really takes a, a team to to have this uh, sort of simulation program. Yeah. And can, can you just sort of elaborate on on that? Uh, you know what what's going on kind of like behind the scenes? And it's it's it seems like there's engineers involved. There's uh, you know researchers. How, how how do you sort of build that team? Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, it starts at your needs assessment, kind of defining the needs for your project um, and then using that to um, take, a, take a moment to sit back and think about what experts you need, um, what kind of resources you need or partnerships. Um, and, you know, we've been grateful in that, you know, pretty much anybody we've reached out to um, for help on these kinds of projects sees the value in them and it's not difficult to get, you know, buy in, but we're also at an awesome academic center with a lot of brilliant people. So I think if you don't have that at your institution, you can reach out to other local institutions. Um, I'm very, you know, grateful to Dr. Maisels at Lurie, um, who, you know, had kind of a pilot curriculum he had developed many years ago on NeoCirc, but he really helped, you know, me turn my vision for this curriculum into something more meaningful and he was very um supportive about the whole thing and me make it um you know my project with my voice um i think you know having a good collaborator for surgical simulation and 3d printing is just really important it's really hard to have a good simulation program without good models and silicone is great for so many different um, types of simulations, um, you know, they're pretty realistic for kidney simulation, penile simulation. Um, so Dr. Elisiri actually has, um, you know, a huge grant um, that's focused on uh, 3D printing technologies for all kinds of simulation. Um, so we developed a partnership with him, you know, early on um, before I even started here. And so once we, once I came here, we were really able to hit the ground running with these projects. But I think that having a collaborator who's interested in 3D printing is helpful um, if you want to build a, a meaningful program. Okay. Now, one, one, of, one of the other things that I, I've sort of heard over the years is that uh, simulation is good for rare procedures or things that don't happen that often. Because it's hard to it's hard to get those sort of hands on real life experiences. But what you're presenting here are fairly common surgical procedures, right? Circumcision, hypospadias. Is that yes. is that am I thinking about this in the wrong way? As simulation should be reserved for rare procedures. I don't think that's wrong at all, but I do think that there are common procedures that have significant learning curves. And so I think maybe getting more data on trainee performance and different procedures can help us find where simulations can be both helpful and effective. And that's where I think, you know, those evaluation apps for surgical trainees, like simple, where we really break down the steps of surgeries very in a very detailed fashion, and then look at how um, trainees are performing in specific steps, that kind of data can really help us identify, um, you know, where a role for even a simple simulation for a specific task may be helpful. 
Um, but I think you're right in that simulation definitely has a role for creating replications um, and opportunities for practice for rare procedures. I think that that's a very important role. I just think that there's more to be done in, in day to day procedures, which hypospadias is for us. But I think, you know, that high complication rate um, and the challenge, the technical challenges of each of those steps, it does merit replication on a regular basis. Yeah, I think that's well said, and and I, I like the idea of sort of trying to, uh, you know, if if you've got a common procedure, but the there are there's morbidity of that procedure, there's plenty of opportunities for improvement, and that's where it seems like simulation can kind of come in and help to sort of bridge that gap and and hopefully decrease the the morbidity, uh, and and with with little risk to the patient. Um, the other question uh, that I think comes up often when we start talking about education and uh, simulation and uh, how do we do that better is is who finances these types of things, right? Because there there seems to be a lot of interest in it from uh, you know leadership and administration, uh, but it's clear that there's a cost uh, associated with high quality simulation and education programs. So how do we how do we go about that and how do we work with our leaders to ensure that these types of programs are financed? Yeah, this is where um, I think we really have a great opportunity to get creative. As you said, it gets expensive over time. Um, I actually, and, and this may be an unpopular opinion, but I think that this is an opportunity for us to engage with industry sponsors. Um, for different instruments that are commonly used um, for surgical procedures. So, um, because I think that a lot of inst um, a lot of industry, uh, like uh, the more prominent industry type groups, um, are interested in improving surgical education, and it's an opportunity for them to, um, you know, kind of interact with us earlier. Now, I think it does get a little. Um, dicey because, you know, you don't want to have undue influence from specific industry partners at different points, you know, um, in trainees educational experiences, but they do have a lot of grants um, that are focused on surgical education. And so that's been an opportunity um, that I found helpful. Um, I think other opportunities are, um, you know, to uh, use, unfortunately, like endowment funding, because the idea is that once you get the ball rolling, once you show the validity of your model, and then you show that it improves outcomes, there will be institutional buy-in for these, right? And that will sustain it. That's the whole idea. But to get to that point in the innovation and pilot stages, I think that, you know, unfortunately, that is one point where industry collaboration can be helpful. Um, and I know in my case, I, I did use it, right? I worked with Neocirc um, as a, a funded corporation. Um, so I think just making sure that we're thoughtful about our interactions with industry um, and that we acknowledge potential bias from that um, is important, um, but it is, you know, it helps us get the ball rolling, which I think is important too. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, those are great points. Uh, I think we have time uh, for, uh, let's go to our last uh, slide, uh, Vinay. I think we're short on time here. Um, so just wanted to remind people coming up on uh, November 15th, we're fortunate to have Dr. Knaedler uh, speaking to us, uh, interacting with us here on our next innovations on new frontiers and laser technology. So you won't wanna miss, miss that. Uh, this presentation uh, will be uh, posted on our website. So we look forward to uh, interacting with you virtually in the future. And uh, once again, wanna thank Dr. Badia for uh, graciously uh, uh, and eloquently presenting to us this morning. And uh, I hope you all have a great uh, morning and a, a good rest of your day. And uh, thank you to the Department of Urology as well as our chair, Dr. Steve Nakata. Um, so long. Bye, thanks.